we're going to move into today's activity, chapter 13. We're going to look at some choices of business entities first. Uh, and so our book tells us about some common forms of business entities. Our sole proprietorship, and then it talks about partnerships, general partnerships, limited partnerships. And then it talks about limited liability partnerships and limited liability companies and corporations. Okay. At some point in your book, you'll see this chart right here that talks about how they'll be laid out. So we're going to talk about the sole proprietorships in Chapter 13. We're going to talk about partnerships, the two types, general partnerships, limited partnerships in Chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, we'll talk about the limited liability partnership and the limited liability company. Uh, next week, we'll talk about, in chapter 15, when we talk about uh, corporations, we'll talk about uh, that in more detail uh, next week. We'll talk about a little piece here on the end of this chapter where they talk about franchises, uh, another type of business entity, uh, but it's really, uh, it really grows out of a contractual relationship, and so you have your franchisor, which is the large umbrella. I'm going to just say, for example, like McDonald's. There are some people who have franchise agreements, they have businesses, they're franchisees of McDonald's or uh, other uh, subway or, you know, these are types of franchise uh, businesses. And out of that, and, and I, I advise against them wholeheartedly because all of the power is in the hands of the franchisor. So the owner, the corporate owner, like the corporate ownership of McDonald's, they're going to have all of the power. They will uh, enter into these franchise agreements where they're kind of like selling the name of their business. Everybody knows about McDonald's. However, you have to play by McDonald's rules, okay? You have to do everything because when I go over there to McDonald's, I want that Big Mac to taste just like that McDonald's Big Mac. I don't want your Big Mac. I want McDonald's Big Mac. When I come through there and I ask for them fries, I want... I want them hot fries that come out of there, the McDonald's fries. I don't, don't, don't put your special recipe. It has to be McDonald's. And so this is how the franchise agreement works because, I mean, they have to make sure that their uh, brand and everything carries on so that you don't ruin the corporate uh, identity of the company. And so it's a very strict agreement, and the agreement is really... Uh, tilted towards the franchisor, which has no, any liability in that company is all going to go on the franchisee. The franchise agreement has a term limit, uh, and then obviously the franchisee has to make payments to the franchisor so they can carry on, you know, they don't have the golden arches. That's how I know it's McDonald's. So, uh, when I go over there, you know, everything has ticked down the list just like it would for any other, you know, the orange drink, the, the, the ice cream, all of the McDonald's. I want all that to be just like McDonald's when I go there. Uh, and so they're gonna, you're going to have to buy their training support and their advertising. Uh, you have to follow their protocols. Uh, it, the agreement is going to cover royalties and fees that the franchisee must pay. It's a lot of, you know, <laughs> I guess it can be something that can make business for the franchisee because they have that name recognition that comes from the franchisor. And uh, termination and cancellation of, the, of, of this relationship is also going to be covered uh, in that agreement. Andrews, a $75 million corporate battle.
the Dancing with the Stars co-host, suing her stalker and the hotel she said allowed him to book a room next to her and secretly record nude video of her through a peephole. ABC's Ryan Smith has the latest for us. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Robin. Erin Andrews suffered through an unthinkable crime. A stalker filming her changing in a hotel, disseminating the videos online. But now she's fighting back in court, claiming both the stalker and the hotel's actions and alleged failings caused her severe and permanent emotional distress. She's known for reporting from the sidelines and as a co-host on ABC's Dancing with the Stars. But this morning, Erin Andrews taking on a very personal challenge, a $75 billion courtroom battle against a stalker and a Tennessee Marriott, claiming the hotel made it easy for him to film her in the nude. This is so humiliating for her, and it continues, and it's never going to stop. The TV star fighting back tears in a Nashville court Tuesday as her lawyers described how Michael David Barrett found her room number, telling the jury Barrett called the Marriott of Vanderbilt University with a strange request. I, Michael Barrett, want a room next to Aaron Andrews. That's my request. And the hotel did nothing to prevent him from finding the room number. Then failed to notice he removed and altered the people on her door to do it. He stands there for four and a half minutes and videos her. But the hotel's lawyers say Barrett pulled a fast one on them. He deceived, he denied, he stalked. Claiming Barrett's criminal behavior was his responsibility, not theirs. Adding he tried to film Andrews in three different hotels over nine months in 2008, always with the same M.O. Takes the phone, calls the hotel here. This is Jeff, Scott, and Andrew, Aaron, Andrews, I need to confirm our reservation. Barrett later posting the videos online, eventually pleading guilty to stalking in 2010 and sentenced to 30 months in prison. But for Andrews, the ordeal shaking her to the core, revealing as a GMA contributor in 2010, her difficulty in coping. Yeah, I would go through the putting my head down because I felt like everywhere I looked, everybody was looking, even if they, I, nobody was looking at me at all. But emerging to be a key advocate in strengthening anti-stalking legislation, even telling Congress in 2010, I had no idea just how serious this crime was until it affected my life. Michael Barrett isn't represented, but is expected to testify in the trial. The hotel's franchise owner tells us they look forward to showing that Nashville Marriott acted reasonably and appropriately. And Andrew's attorneys could call witnesses who know her and work with her to talk about the emotional distress that she suffered. The trial is expected to last nearly two weeks, Robin. All right, Ryan, thank you. We're bringing ABC's chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, now. We know the stalker already convicted in criminal court. How strong is this civil suit? It's a very strong civil suit against him. But he doesn't have money. So the question is going to be, how strong a case is it against the franchise owner, against the management company, et cetera? That's where you're talking about the potential for deep pockets and the potential to pay. So this is really a, a case where we're going to talk about how much and who pays it more than was there any wrongdoing. And when we say how much, she's asking for $75 million. $75 million. She had been asking for $10 million. She increased it now to $75 million. Keep in mind for context here, on average, most wrongful death cases in civil court pay out three to five million dollars. So when you're asking for 75 million in a case like this, it's an enormous number. Uh, and certainly I would think more than she's gonna get. But again, the question is gonna be who has to pay it and do they have to all pay it together even though there's no question that he, the stalker, is the person who's primarily responsible. Well, the hotel has you know, said, this is terrible what happened, put it all on him. Well, what is their defense? Right, the question is, was it negligent? Did they do something? Meaning, the defense is, look, he fooled us. He was an insurance executive. He knew how to play the game. He knew how to ask for the right room. Her position is gonna be, no, no, no. They should never have allowed him to be in that room next to me, and they should have found that peephole a lot earlier. Okay, so Ryan said, a couple more weeks, and we should be. Absolutely. All right, thank you. So uh, he talked about how she had asked for ten million. So you know, this is how cases matriculate. You know, you you file the lawsuit and then you try to settle it with the person. You'll ask them if um, okay, you know, ten million dollars. I guess they said no, thank you. They didn't want to pay that. So now we're in trial, and. Um, I guess at this point she's now asking for the $75 million. And so here's her lawsuit. And look, 
she is suing, she sued everybody. She threw in the kitchen sink. And this is what we do. I mean, you sue every deep pocket you can find to try to get your money because you know this guy right here, this sleeves bag right here does not have one guy. This is the actual defendant who did the, the dirty deed. But she sues Marriott International, which is the franchisor. Okay? And we t I talked earlier to you about how when you enter into these franchise agreements, you're going to be left hope. The franchisor is going to be a win-win for them. They're going to leave with their hands clean. Okay, so everybody is in the lawsuit here, and she's going after everybody. She's like, okay, you know, uh, I'm surprised. Well, I think it's because she was asking for ten million, <laughs> but I'm surprised that they didn't just say. I'm surprised they weren't able to get it settled for ten million dollars. Cause see, it's still even though it's the franchisees that's causing all this havoc for them, it's still ruining the Marriott business name. So in some instances, you could probably see their lawyers try to, you know, make some type of offer, but I just think 10 million was probably too much, I guess, uh, for them. And so this is what uh, that state court lawsuit so, looks like. The franchisor, before the case went to trial, the franchisor filed a motion asking the court to dismiss it from the lawsuit. So Marriott International is no longer in the suit. And, uh, well, so they filed that motion, and on January the 29th, the judge granted Marriott's motion for summary judgment on all claims, filed, finding that Marriott was the franchisor and did not control the Nashville Hotel uh, and was not responsible for the lack of cameras, was not responsible for the lack of supervision. Uh, although, and that's what I was telling you about the franchise agreement, you know, it has, although, I mean, you want to say they didn't control it, but they really do control. It's a lot of control in a franchise agreement, but they're going to always come out not having any liability. All the liability for that business is going to be born by the uh, franchisee. And that's why we were talking about all of these business entity types, because up until now, most of all of the business entities that we've talked about have dealt with situations where the entity uh, is going to carry all of the liability. This goes through uh, the trial. That major victory a $55 million guilty verdict in her case against the stalker and the hotel that gave him a room next to hers. The jury, siding with Andrews after emotional testimony, speaking of her humiliation and shame that followed the video taken of her through a peephole seen by nearly 17 million people. ABC's Eva Pilgrim inside the courtroom when the verdict was read today. Late today, the verdict in the Aaron Andrews case. What amount of damages have been in due award the plan of Aaron Andrews? 55 correct? Yes. The jury has decided that National Marriott shares the blame for that secretly recorded naked video that was seen by more than 17 million people. You know her body? And I saw it for two seconds and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Andrews claiming the hotel made it easy for her stalker, Michael Barrett, to get a room next door to hers and through a people use his cell phone to shoot video of her getting out of the shower. They connected me so that I knew what room, what room she was in. Barrett pled guilty to stalking in 2010 and served 27 months in prison. She sued him, the National Marriott, and the hotel's management company, their lawyers claiming throughout the trial that Andrew's career was not harmed, but has in fact thrived since this happened. She's not claiming her career was ruined because of this. She's saying her life was ruined because of this. Do you believe you will ever get over this? No. David Stalker Michael Barrett was found to be 51% at fault, making him responsible for more than $28 million in damages, which he'll have trouble coming up with. The hotel management company and owners were found to be 49% at fault. They'll have to pay out more than $26 million. David? And Eva, have we heard from Aaron Anders tonight? David, yes, she tweeted thanking all of the victims out there for their support to stand up 
and hold accountable those whose job it is to protect everyone's safety and privacy. David? Eva Pilgrim inside that Nashville courthouse tonight. Eva, thank you. So once the trial and the jury comes back with the $55 million verdict, obviously Marriott wants to make it clear to everybody that that's not them. It's their franchisee because, see, their business name is being ruined by all of this that's going on. And that's really why, I, 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 you know, I don't know. I guess it's six in one hand and half a dozen in another. I cannot see why they could not settle that case. But um, I certainly would have advised them as their attorney to come up with some amount of money because the money is not coming out of Marriott's pocket. Okay? That money is going gonna, is gonna to be their insurance carry. It's going to pay that money out. So even though they are out of the case, all I hear is Marriott. It's Marriott. The $55 million Marriott, 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 their name is being run through the mud. And so they have to decide uh, what value that is going to have on the business. I'm going to ask your opinion. I could ask people to raise their hand, but nobody's going to raise their hand, so I got to do it this way. Do you think the $55 million verdict is too high? A. Yes. B. No. Oh. That's causing a little bit of struggle. Some people are thinking that it's too now high. If there is any type of a wrong that has been done to somebody in any of the categories that we talked about last week, we talked about those intentional torts, and then and we talked about the negligence and the strict liability, any of those, that's what that's where the money comes from. I mean, I've had all kinds. Yes, sir. Uh, can, like, uh, one, one of the defendants settle? Yes, but see, in a case like this, except for the guy, all the rest of them are kind of together. Even Marriott International, I mean, you know, so so they all, all of their insurance carriers get together, and either one is going to settle. I mean, some because you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to settle that thing, and then. The one party settles, she can still come back with a seventy-five thousand dollar verdict. I mean, seventy-five million dollar verdict against that one person. They would have to carry that all on their own. So yes, that happens all the time. But once I realize somebody's gonna settle, they kind of all settle. This is not. We're talking about seventy-five million dollars now. Fifty-five million dollars. You have normal policies that have like a million dollars. Okay, a normal business policy have like a million dollars on it. Okay, so now we don't have just one. We got X, the X, ex, what we call the excess carriers are now in the case. So you have all these people who are coming together to decide whether one, if we one, we all going to fall together or we all going to. You know, so if one settles, the other ones will try to probably try to come up with the money because if she's, when you look at a case like that, we call it exposure from an insurance carrier standpoint. That's, to me, you, you, you do a report as the attorney, they want to know the insurance carrier because it's really not the business, okay? The business, they have a decision about it, but they have purchased insurance and in that insurance, they have purchased attorneys who represent them on behalf of the insurance company. And so the attorney is going to say to them, the insurance carrier won't know how much exposure is there. This is like 100%. I mean, hello? I mean, you, you, the people, the man call up and you just tell them what room she's in? That's just completely. So yes, you do have, you can have some parties that will uh, settle. But then those ones that are left, they'll be like, well, wait a minute. I don't have anybody to share in this verdict with me. So I'm going to try to.
come up with you know some kind of way to settle also. So they were just I I cannot see how this case got to trial with I mean with her name recognition, you know. I mean, everybody knows her. I mean, can they see a jury? Who, what jury? What, I don't know what they were thinking. I, I, don't, I know they didn't think they were going to win. So at some point, too, I think that people think, I think they probably thought she wouldn't carry it through. You know, she wouldn't get on the stand because see, what they had to do was they had to play the video in the trial. So I don't think they thought that got some people's attention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they thought she was going to go through with it, maybe. But she she stuck it out. And so now, do you all are still not Do you think, okay, so you got the sleeves bag, but then you have the other, and, and, and Marriott International is out of it. Marriott International was the deep, deep, deep pocket, okay? So, but you still have the franchisee uh, and their investors who, you know, have a lot of money. They, I'm sure they have insurance. So uh, do you think the guy said that that she'll definitely get her money from them? Uh, do you think uh, Aaron Andrews will receive any of the $55 million verdict? think she'll get though. Do you think she'll get the money from the sleeve bag who did the videotape? No. Well, let's see. Just like in the first time? Uh, he was in the business. He was like a Fox sportscaster or something like that. So he knew her, you know, she she's real big into the she was, she's real big into like um, college football, and he knew her from that. That's that's what he, and I guess he just completely was berserk over her. But he ended up falling for that place. So he filed for bank. Because here is his bankruptcy uh, lawsuit. And so he files that. The, the, the verdict hasn't even come back yet. He already goes to the bankruptcy court and files his bankruptcy so that he does not have to pay the judgment. We're going to talk more about bankruptcy next week. But this gives us a little uh, preview into uh, bankruptcy. And, and so this is what happens um, when you, even if we're not dealing with the business owner, we're talking about the individual here. But when you have the types of business entities that we've talked about so far, okay, <clears throat> that liability can come on to the owner of the business on their personal liability, okay? And so their personal assets. And so what that means is that a person can sue you personally. There is no uh, limitation on liability to the person as a result of, that, of these types of business entities that we've talked about so far. <clears throat> A little later on in, in the class today, we're going to talk about limited liability types of business entities. And those business entities, the feature of having those types of businesses is that when the business is sued, that liability goes to the business and not to the person. And so here, in a situation like this, if you're in that sole proprietorship, or in one of those general or limited partnerships, and you are a party in one of those types of business entities, a person can sue you personally. Okay, when that happens, you're gonna have a judgment on your credit, 
or you're going to have to go to bankruptcy and see if you can get that judgment discharged in the bankruptcy. And so that is what this guy did. Before the verdict comes back, he goes to the bankruptcy court and files a bankruptcy. And that is what this is. Now, he, he lives in Oregon, and so he files this in the federal bankruptcy court in Oregon. So what you have to do when that happens is uh, you will file the bankruptcy. I'm going to show you what it looks like. And you have to list all of your debts, your judgments, and all of that stuff on there because that's the whole point of filing the bankruptcy so that the bankruptcy judge can then discharge all of that debt, the judgments, whatever it may be. So meanwhile, Aaron Andrews finds out that he has filed that bankruptcy. And so she has, so see, look at all these attorneys, you know, attorneys everywhere on this situation. So she had to get a bankruptcy attorney to file a, what we call an adversary complaint in the bankruptcy court to, into, it's like really a motion asking the bankruptcy judge not to discharge this debt. And so here is his bankruptcy complaint right here. And so this is what the bankruptcy complaint looks like. So then that will keep the creditors off. But he doesn't even have any secured claims. He's filing this for the sole purpose of getting beyond the uh, lawsuit. And he has no secured claims. Nashville Marriott a potential claim so he's looking out even for any potential claims that are going to come back from that Nashville Marriott as a result of depending on he has all of the potent, all of the pending uh, lawsuit claims he has listed them here he doesn't even know what the value of some of them are because they haven't even happened yet Then he lists here the, uh, the name of the lawsuit. And he doesn't even know what the amount is pending, pending, pending. 
but he is really filing this bankruptcy so that when the time comes for the verdict to come down, he's hoping that the uh, bankruptcy would be uh, <clears throat> discharged. But she finds an attorney who files her complaint uh, to determine the dischargeability and uh, And so the judge does grant her motion, or grant her petition, and finds that he, that the, uh, the verdict in this lawsuit would not be discharged in that bankruptcy. So in that regard, if he does ever get any type of money, and so then what will happen in that particular bankruptcy court, the judge will enter, not only does he now have the judgment in the state court, but then the bankruptcy judge is going to enter a bankruptcy ju a judgment uh, in the amount of the verdict, or however much he owes in that verdict. So he's not going to be able to get away from uh, payment of that, and like I talked about earlier, he could even have his wages garnished, a bank, a bank account garnished. There are many ways that she can go after payment of his portion of that judgment. <clears throat> but the other defendants for their particular portion, they do end up settling with her. Uh, and as we talked about before, <clears throat> when it comes to settlement agreements, that amount is confidential. Well, I have no idea how much they settled for. It's probably $10 million. <laughs> that would be a shame for her to do all of that and still just get $10 million. But in any case. So are there any questions about that case? Yes, sir. Uh, why do they settle? Now, uh, okay, so if, so they're like, so how much, they're like 26 million they owe? So they, I mean, they just have to appeal that. They've already gone through a two-week trial. So I'm just saying, I'm just giving you a small estimate of how much attorney's fees that will be. I'm just saying by myself. I can see about $300,000, $400,000, in attorney's fees for the trial, okay? Now they would have to appeal that, which is like, so they're going to be a million dollars in on attorney's fees altogether once it's all said and done at the very least. So they need to just go ahead and settle this. And so that's what they... I mean, it's, it's going to be more cost effective because if you go and you spend the money on appeal, come back down, and you still have the judgment, what's the point? Uh, so, 